Thanks for joining us as we come together to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today in this service. And we are so excited about this fall season and all of the new things that are starting here at church and getting underway. We pray that you will find things that will help you grow in your faith. I'm Pastor Steve Carlson, in case you don't recognize me with the, with the mask on today. And I just want to, to mention the, the sermon title today, To Mask or Not to Mask, that is not the question. Truth be told, we can get uh, really bent out of shape with these masks and a lot of conversations about them, and they can sometimes become so distracting. And today, God reminds us that really the masks aren't the issue, but rather, how can we grow in our faith and how can we move forward in the kingdom of God? And so that is our prayer, that that will be a blessing to you today, this service, and that God will help you as you continue to grow forward in your faith and our church as well as a whole. And so God bless you as we grow together. Our call to worship this morning from Isaiah 45. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. To me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. And we open this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Let us bow or kneel for the confession of our sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto Thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean. 
and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who hast given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by thy Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will and true obedience to thy word, that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only begotten Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. The one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Let's stand together now and turn to our introit, which you'll find read, uh, written in your bulletin, printed there, and we'll read that responsively. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of your anointed. How amiable are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And for our hymn of praise, please turn to page six and we will sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of I Know Whom I Have Believed.
be with you. Let's pray. Keep, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy church with thy perpetual mercy. And because the frailty of man without thee cannot but fall, keep us ever by thy help from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. You may be seated. We'll turn now to our scripture lesson. The Old Testament lesson is from Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Our psalm is Psalm 103, beginning with verse 1, and we'll read that responsively. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Our epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat, and gives thanks to God." For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him whom Christ, for whom Christ died. 
Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace in the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Our gradual reading, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Alleluia, alleluia. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Alleluia. Holy Gospel lessons from the Gospel of St. Matthew, 18th chapter, beginning with verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's now confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time I call upon the senior choir to bless us in song.
Thank you for that. That's the first time since I've been at Ruth Frid that I've heard the senior choir. <clears throat> it was beautiful. <clears throat> when I first got here, I thought, you know, uh, maybe I'll consider joining the choir. And uh, then I hear that. And then I hear Pastor Dennis in my head, if you can sing and you can find at least two other people who agree with you, then you can consider maybe joining. So now I'm not so sure. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I want to invite the children to come forward at this time for the children's message. And uh, just want to remind you, hopefully, evening journey through the Word and kids' time will be starting up in October we look forward to that morning journey actually starts this Wednesday, so we're excited about that. And we do, you can see there in your bulletin, our altar flowers today are presented by Mick and Marlene Nowicki. Uh, and thanks to God for 45 wonderful years of marriage. So congratulations to, to Mick and Marlene. And uh, by the way there, you can see Bob and Judy Boyd. 50th anniversary this Saturday, September 19th. So praise God for that. I wanted to also share with you <clears throat> in our section there, known to be hospitalized, Susie Barrett had a successful surgery this week, and she's actually back home. So we're praising God for that. Feel free to send her cards and call her. She uh, is grateful to God for that surgery, how that went. Sharon Alsop is now uh, hopefully temporarily at Concordia, no longer at St. Clair. Erna Yoakum is now in skilled nursing care at Concordia. Bob Thomas remains at home on hospice care. Timmy Langkamp, hopefully, uh, temporarily is at Paramount and will be returning home soon. We uh, pray for that. Uh, I just want to remind you also that we do extend Christian love and sympathy to Lyndon Baxendale on the death of her husband, Bob. The funeral will be here at Ruthfrid uh, starting at 11.15 on Wednesday, and a luncheon will follow that and uh, burial will be at the National Cemetery of the Alleghenies because Bob was a U.S. Army veteran. We do have Sunday school starting again today, and we're excited about that. Hope to see the kids here and, and all of our teachers. We have a great slate of teachers and hoping to, to share the Word of God with the kids here again through Sunday school. Please be praying for Joan Morton, who's preparing for another uh, knee replacement surgery on the 15th. And also wanted to share, if you look at page 22 of your bulletin, you'll see that we have a grief share group coming up, Loss of a Spouse, and that will be on Monday, September 28th here at Ruthfrid. At last count, there were at least 79 people here at Ruthfrid who are widows or widowers. So uh, this is a great ministry. I uh, hope that you can come to that. The Lutherans for Life, also that regional conference is coming up on September 26th. And that conference info and registration can be found at lutheransforlife.org. Those are all the announcements I have for you. It's great to see you kids. Thanks so much for coming up and joining me today. And you know what I have here in this bag? I have my, my lunch for today. How does that sound? Do you get hungry when you're at church? No? Some of you do? I get, I get kind of hungry. Just had a little snack time in the middle or something maybe, huh? So let, let's see what I have for lunch here. Oh, here we have um, oh, some, some beef sticks. How many of you like beef sticks? What? Just, oh, okay, a couple of you guys. Okay, they taste really good. They really do. I love them. That's a great snack. You sure you don't like these? Yeah, maybe. No? Okay. All right, well, maybe, maybe you like some of this, some salary. That's what you like. Okay, all right. So who would like to have the salary for, for lunch? Okay, you get it, and you get the beef sticks. Okay, so it's uh, the meat eaters and the vegetarians, I guess, huh? Yeah, I know you like other stuff as well, too. And, and then um, some water. That's good, right? Have some water. Do you like water? No, you don't like water? You like, okay, that's, yeah, water, that's pretty a basic thing, isn't it? Okay, so we have some water. Well, in our scripture text today, it talks about a church where some of the people in the church, they said, you know what, meat. We are the meat eater part of the church. We love meat. And the other one said, nope, no meat. We love vegetables. And we love vegetables so much that no meat for you either. We're all going to have vegetables. What do you think about that? Not so good, no, no. And the meat eater said, nope, we're not doing that. In fact, we're having meat. We really are. And, and so they were like having a fight, a food fight, right? 
a food fight at church, yes, and they decide, you know, this isn't going to work. In fact, now we don't even want to talk to each other because we don't like what you eat. And so pretty soon you can't even have a church anymore because people don't even like each other and they won't talk to each other and they forget that they're actually supposed to come to church and worship God, right? Instead, they're fighting about food. Yeah. Are there things that can distract us today? Keep us from worshiping God? Have people fight over and stuff? Yeah, there are, aren't there? Yeah. Maybe one of the things right now is sitting on our face even, isn't it? Yeah, these, these past, yeah, right. Yeah. You guys do a great job with them and stuff. Sometimes I have a hard time. They get stuck on my glasses, and then my glasses get fogged up. Has it ever happened to your glasses? Yeah, things like that. Yeah, they get tangled up and stuff, or they, or they break or whatever. Yeah, so different things. So it's, sometimes it's a distraction, and sometimes I complain about it and whine and, and stuff. But really it's kind of a small thing in, in the scope of it all because what I really, really love is being here with you guys. Yeah, and worshiping God together with you. And so there are things that distract us and so forth that way. And hopefully, you know, we won't have to worry as much longer. Hopefully, that's, that's, that'll be great. But for now, we do. And some people really need to wear them because of their health, right? And, and then some people maybe really need to not wear them because of their health, too, because they have a hard time breathing with them. And so God says, you know what? Be kind to each other. Be kind. Understand that people coming from different sides of the of the coin on that on that issue and they're doing their very best so that we can still love and care for each other and some people can be here with us and other people can't be here in the building with us but they can watch on their tv on the live stream or on their on their phone and so they're still together with us that way as well too and worshiping god so we want to pray that god helps us to love and to care for each other and to know that we are still brothers and sisters in christ even if sometimes we're not sure what we should eat right and God says, you know what? Meat is just fine, and vegetables just fine. Yeah. All right, so let's pray, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you that you love us, even though sometimes we are so very different, and we have different things that we like and things that we don't like. And we pray you help us to not think that that's the most important thing, but to know that you are the most important thing of all. And we pray that you help us to grow in our love for you and for each other, and to think about how much you Love us so very much that you came to us, Lord Jesus, to be our Savior. And just pray your blessing on these kids now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming up and helping me. And you can go and be seated and invite the congregation to stand and sing together our sermon hymn.
Our scripture passage, Romans chapter 14, has been read in its entirety by reading one verse again, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would speak to us afresh your word, that you would feed us richly from your word, that you would equip us for living life in love for you and one another. We pray in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Titled the message today, To Mask or Not to Mask, that is not the question. Now, near our house stands Old St. Luke's Church. I love that old building because I love history, love church buildings. My kids know that whenever we're like driving or new places or something, I'm always looking for church buildings and the history of it and so forth. I'm kind of a spiritual archaeologist that way. And I've been in uh, Old St. Luke's Church a number of times. I actually even did a wedding there. And Fred used to have the keys. Do you still have the keys, Fred, for Old St. Luke's? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. And Fred had the keys. And so I had a personal tour of the museum that's down in the cellar underneath the church. Now, the church dates back, the congregation, to 1765. And so in the graveyard, there's graves of French and Indian uh, war soldiers, as well as Revolutionary War soldiers and so forth. But I found that the church, the congregation, had become divided after the War of Independence and the founding of the United States. And the issue that split the congregation was that of taxes and the role of government. Now, familiar to most of us here in Southwest PA is the Whiskey Rebellion of the 1790s when George Washington was president. It was the largest armed civil uprising in the United States until the Civil War. And what was at stake was how the government decided to tax whiskey that the farmers in Southwest PA were making out of their grain. And at the heart of the debate of the issue was the question, does the government have the authority to tax? Who does the counting of the whiskey stills? How does one count? Does one get taxed according to how much whiskey one could potentially make or how much one actually makes, and who really knows? The farmers and businessmen of southwest Pennsylvania here felt like they had just risked their lives fighting in the Revolutionary War against the, the British in order to, to gain their freedoms, and now they felt like they had to fight their own government to gain their freedoms. They focused on individual freedoms, autonomy, and self-responsibility. But the other side of the whiskey barrel, if you will, were those who wanted strong national identity and unity and government regulation. And there was also the issue that President Washington's whiskey stills in Virginia were not being taxed the same as those in Pennsylvania. And the disparity is still keenly felt if you go on a tour over at the Oliver Miller Homestead. They will still let you know that with great passion. It was kind of like, uh, at, at that time, it was kind of like you people who live in the Capitol Beltway, you make the rules and give yourself a pass, but us out here in Pennsylvania on the west side have to live by your rules. And it was really strongly felt. And the matter came to a head near the Oliver Miller Homestead when a government agent tried to collect taxes. And in response, the other producers, led by Oliver Miller, marched into town against General George Neville, who was the regional tax collector over there in Scott Township. And a gun battle ensued, and Oliver Miller Jr. was shot and killed. And so in response, the farmers burned down Neville's house. Ironically, the Millers and, and Neville were related. The issue now had even divided families. And in, and in Washington, PA, tax collectors were tarred and feathered and run out of town. So President Washington began marching toward Southwest PA with 12,000 men, the only time a sitting president has ever led a standing army, to put down the uprising. He feared that the fragile unity of the nation was about to completely unravel and that everything that had been won in the war for independence would be lost in this division. And old St. Luke's was caught in the middle because General Neville, the chief tax collector, was a member. An important, upstanding, powerful member. But other members were on the other side of the issue. And the congregation was split. And the church closed for a number of years. Its spiritual mission was overshadowed and sidelined by the discord and division over the issue of taxing and the view of government. 
The issue was real, it was intensely economical, and it was extremely politicized. It also became a symbol of other issues, and people said and did nasty things toward each other based on what they thought about where one another stood on different issues. And as people advanced their political agendas, the kingdom of God seemed to be losing ground in people's hearts and in their daily lives and in society as a whole. Now, in our text today, we come to the book of Romans. A couple weeks ago, it was chapter 12, the ingredients of love. Today, chapter 14, how do we as Christians live out that love toward our brothers and sisters in Christ in our church with whom we disagree with on some things? And the congregation in Rome was already facing intense external pressures and persecution under Emperor Nero and the Roman Empire. And the last thing that they needed was to tear their congregation apart internally over petty matters. And the issue of the day that Paul addressed was, as we talked about with the children, eating meat versus eating vegetables. And it's not just that some people really hated broccoli and that some people really loved steak, but rather the division over food had become a dividing line for the entire church. The meat-eater Christians... Basically, we're saying meat is great, meat is healthy, meat has been declared clean by God, meat is godly, meat is on the menu, summer barbecue is the only way to go, and if you don't eat meat, you're a wimp. We are strong, you are weak. That's kind of how it went. And the vegetarian Christians responded, meat has been sacrificed to idols, and we don't want to be contaminated by it. We, and especially the Jewish Christians, still want to keep Jewish kosher laws and also keep the Sabbath laws because these are the right things to do. We are right and you are wrong. And some even went so far as to say, and all of you who are eating meat have to stop. And if you do not, it's because you're not really true Christians. You don't really love God or care about others. Well, the meat eaters looked down their nose at the vegetarians from their perch of common sense and strong conviction, and they despised them with a pride of practicality. And the vegetarians looked down their nose on the meat eaters from their perch of religious superiority and condemned them with legalistic self-righteousness. The issue of eating or not eating meat had become a dividing line, a flashpoint, a symbol of whether or not you thought the other person had genuine spiritual faith. It became so divisive that church conversations were no longer about faith, but now simply about food. And then it probably became so contentious that there was no longer any conversation at all. Just two different camps of a divided congregation of a paralyzed church. You know, Satan, he could actually care less about vegetables or meat. And for that matter, viruses or masks. He really doesn't care. Satan is willing to use anything to try and steal, kill, and destroy the work of God in you. Whatever tool works, whatever issue divides, he will use that for his purposes. Satan wants to distract us from spiritual life in Christ. He wants us to get so focused on our self-righteousness and to lose sight of the righteousness of Christ. Satan wants to destroy the peace in our heart and to drain the joy of the Lord right out of our spirit. And so the Apostle Paul marches on Rome with this very letter. And he reminds the Christians that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, verse 17. Paul is saying in these troubled times, don't forget what the kingdom of God is all about. Don't get sidetracked or or sidelined on these small and petty things. Remember how much God loves you. So he's saying about God's wondrous love, his amazing, his amazing grace that he has made known to us, and that though we were unworthy, Christ in love redeemed us for his own amazing love of God. God has loved us and called us to live out his love toward one another and to be filled with forgiveness and grace for one another. And as we think about how much God loves us and cares for us, our issues with one another and our differences and our opinions become rather small. In comparison to Jesus' death on the cross and forgiveness and grace and salvation for the Roman Christians, both the Jewish ones and the Gentile ones, their differences about what to eat, meat, or Vegetables, quite insignificant. True, there were cultural issues, there were religious issues, strong differences of opinion, but you can be a faithful Christian and eat meat. And you can be a faithful Christian and not eat meat. So don't have contempt for one another and don't condemn each other. 
You know, the world is always at each other's throats, isn't it? But Paul is saying, but you put down the knife and come together to the table of Christian fellowship and love in the peace of God. And so in our text, chapter 14, Paul gives five paragraphs. Now, don't worry, the message isn't just starting. Some of you are thinking, whoa, we're just getting to it here. Okay, I saw that, Roger. Okay, five paragraphs that had them broken apart there in the bulletin, so it's easy to, to look at them. We're just going to uh, glean uh, a thought from each one here, though the first one is a bonus. There's two instructions, something to do and something not to do. Do, accept one another. Now, this isn't saying accept any sin issue, or actually don't accept any sin issues. The church isn't called by God to accept sin. This is talking here about strong differences of opinion of non-sin issues. So accept, make a place, make a welcome in your fellowship and in your heart for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Even if you strongly disagree with their menu or their politics or their music or their worship style. That's what we are to do. What we are not to do is don't judge. If you eat meat, don't have contempt or, dis or despise the one who just can't bring himself to eat meat. If your conscience is not clear to eat the meat, then don't judge the one who has no fear in doing so. We are all Christian servants of God and stand before God. So let this be between you and God alone, Paul is saying, and between that person and God alone. You can see their practices, but don't you be the judge of it. In our Old Testament lesson today, Joseph, when his brothers come to him, they are afraid now that their father has died, and they are afraid that Joseph will use his power against them. And he says, am I in the place of God? And he forgives them, and in doing so, gave them freedom and pointed them to look to God and live, live in fear and reverence of God and not in fear of Him. So we are to point one another to God. It's not fear of us, but live out our faith in God. The second paragraph is give thanks and worship to God. Give thanks for every meal that you have, regardless of what is on the menu. Give thanks for every breath of air that you breathe, whether through a mask or without a mask. Give thanks and worship God on every day that He gives you. The Jewish Christians, they wanted to worship on Saturday because that's how they had always done it. We've always done it that way. The Gentile Christians, they wanted to worship God on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. And that's why the church does worship on Sunday, by the way. But today, Christians in Muslim-controlled countries worship on Friday because that's the day that the Muslims close everything down for worship. And so, it makes sense for the Christians to also worship then on Friday. And God is saying, I don't particularly care which day as long as there's a day that you do worship, and actually every day should be a day of worship in the life of a Christian. It says our entire life is to be about worshiping Jesus. If we live or if we die, we live and die for the Lord, verse 8. Because Jesus the Lord died for us, he lives for us, he is the Lord of us in life and in death and in eternal life. So get living, Paul's saying. There's true and total freedom in this. You know, today we are living in a culture of fear, over death. That's not God's will for us. Think of Paul. If he had been so afraid of losing his life, he never would have gone on any missionary journey. But he had perfect peace because his life was in the Lord's hands. I love how Martin Luther put it. In the midst of the plague there in Europe, he said, I will not take foolish risks, but I will do my part to stay healthy. But I will also risk my life to help others when they are in need. I'm not afraid of dying. I will do all I can stay alive to stay alive, but when it's my time to die, I am ready to go. The Lord will find me on that day, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. If that is my day, He will find me, and I will go be, to be with Him without fear and for all eternity. The third paragraph is don't judge. Wow, it seems like we need to hear that a lot, I guess. It keeps like repeating that in all of them. It says, do not despise others for being so afraid. Don't condemn others for being so careless. God alone is the judge. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. God is our master, and we are accountable to him. The fourth paragraph says, you guessed it, don't judge. <laughs> don't cause, and don't cause each other to stumble, but help one another to stand. So not only don't judge, but don't cause others to stumble, but help them to stand. And Paul is saying, personally, he says, I'm fine with eating meat. I have no fear. My conscience is, convinc is convicted on this and clear but some are afraid and unsure, and they're convinced it's wrong. And so in 1 Corinthians, in what sometimes we call the meat chapter, Paul says, when my Christian friends are with me who don't want to eat meat, 
I give up my right to eat meat. I don't invite them over to my house for a barbecue. No, we can, we're fine with eating vegetables on that day. Not a problem. Because I don't want to do things that would hurt my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. By the way, vegetarians can also <laughs> cause pain for meat eaters. It goes both ways, doesn't it? In verse 15, he says, For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Paul says, remember, food is just food. Don't let that become a stumbling block. Be willing to give that up. I'm reminded of one of my aunts, and she was at our home when I was a child. She was rather opposed to eating certain things, especially wild kind of meat. And we happened to have caught a large snapping turtle. And uh, we had a neighbor who did butchering and so forth, and he, he dressed that snapper out for us. And we were having snapping turtle and chicken for Sunday dinner. And my aunt was, was there with us. And us kids were really excited about this, really excited about this. And we didn't tell her that snapper was on the menu. We just kept talking about how great the chicken was. How great the chicken was. Would she like to have another piece of chicken, perhaps? This is really good chicken. And finally, we coaxed her into having a piece that was of the snapper side of the platter. And afterwards, we, we joyfully let her know that she had had snapping turtle and was none the worse for it. A little embarrassed to say that today. Yeah, she was not very excited about that. We caused her hurt and pain, and then I think we were caused a little hurt and pain, maybe as, as well. That's not the way to go about it, is it? it, it not at all. And, and so we need to have respect and care for one another. Uh, if we jump down to that last paragraph, Paul uses the issues of uh, meat and wine. And today, that would, that would be applicable as well. If someone is struggling with, with issues of alcoholism, we don't want to invite them over to our home and, and serve them alcohol. In other words, we'd probably even drink it ourselves. We'd want to do all we could to, to help them. Our youngest son has a food allergy, as, as you know. And, and here at Ruth Bread, it's so awesome to make sure he always has something to eat, but sometimes it's not the same thing, right? And he understands that as he's gotten older. When he was younger, I always wanted to have all the same things, but he's as old as he understands some things he can have, some things he can't have. As we grow in Christian maturity, we recognize that some things others can have, some things we shouldn't have. But for those who aren't there yet, we want to give up certain rights to make sure that things work out well for them. And our last paragraph is pursue peace and build others up in the faith. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Serve Christ in this way, for this is acceptable to God. This is what's on God's menu for you. Righteousness and peace and joy and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. The goal for the church is to build people up in their faith in Christ, to build up the kingdom of God. I know right now we're struggling in some ways with the COVID-19 restrictions. Some days it gets irritating and frustrating, and especially when churches seem to get the short end of the deal sometimes. But truthfully, as Joseph said, this was meant for evil, but God meant it for good. This has been good for the church in many ways. Live streaming has reached so many. Many members who've had to move away for jobs or retirement or, or whatever have reconnected with the church. New people have found a new church home because it helped them think about church not as a building, but rather as a, as a fellowship in Christ. It's maybe helped us as well to get over being too focused on counting numbers and instead think about how can we just help people grow. Praise in the Park was an opportunity that we did we'd never done before. Bur Vacation Bible School, doing it online, it continues to go forth and, and minister to children. Home Bible studies. A number of people said, you know what, I'm not comfortable going to church for a large group, but I would have a small group of people I know, or maybe my family or just a few neighbors, in my home for a Bible study. God is, is opening up all kinds of new doors because of this. You know, our goal has not been to try to get everyone back in the building. It has not been to try to get all the pieces back together like they once were. That probably will never happen. Some things have changed, never to return to the former ways. And that's okay, because God is doing new things and opening new doors. Rather than letting the coronavirus and the masks become a dividing issue, 
Let us pray and ask God to cause them to be a multiplying force. Because to mask or not to mask is not the question. The real question is, how can we build up one another in the faith and grow the kingdom of God? Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these generous gifts that have been given in worship to your holy name. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless each gift, each giver. God, that you would multiply these gifts, use them to proclaim forth the good news of salvation here and around the world. We pray in your name. Amen. This time I want to invite forward all of our Sunday school teachers, uh, Journey Through the Word teachers and small group leaders, um, our preschool teachers, uh, any others as well that have, are in different positions of teaching and leading uh, this fall as we begin those new ministries. Kids time, did I mention kids time? Come on up as well too. Even though some of those are not starting till next month, please come up for our commissioning, our installation at this time. And Pastor McMahon, if you'd join me as well. We are so blessed with so many who have been called and have answered that call to serve the Lord in this way and to, to teach and to love children and adults as we grow together in our faith in the Lord Jesus. Beloved in the Lord, you have been chosen to serve as leaders, as teachers here at Ruth Fred Lutheran Church. Hear the word of the Lord concerning the office of teaching in the Christian church. And God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the faith, and for the knowledge of the Son of God. We might all attain unto that unity of faith, to a mature man, to be the measure of the statute which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself has commanded, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And in his great commission to the Christian church, he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Here also concerning the duties of the offices, the positions to which you have been called. It will be your duty to remember those who you teach and lead and guide, to remember them in prayer, to be diligent in your preparation for teaching, to be in attendance personally at Sunday, at Sunday school and, and divine worship, to maintain order and discipline in your classrooms, to show your students all times a good example in word and deed, and in general, to discharge the duties of your office according to the constitution of this congregation and the teachings and practices of the Lutheran Church. As you think of these solemn responsibilities, you will realize that your strength is insufficient. And you are encouraged to remember that our sufficiency is from the Lord. I commend you to the grace of God in Jesus Christ who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. I ask you on behalf of Ruth for Lutheran Church, do you accept the position which you have been called, and do you promise to fulfill your duties faithfully and in accordance with the word of God and the constitution of this congregation? If so, answer, yes, by the help and grace of God. Yes, by the help and grace of God. Amen. God bless you. And Pastor McMinn, would you lead us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who have taken this responsibility, Father, to teach your people, your word, especially the children of this congregation, uh, but also uh, everyone 
of every age. And we pray, Father, that you would walk through your word with us. We need you to help us teach, Father. Teach your word faithfully at all times. And we do, Father, especially for those who are teaching children. We recognize that we, as their teachers, are merely assisting their parents and their grandparents as they seek to teach them your word as well and to disciple them and model faithful life, uh, the, the faithful life of a Christian. Father, help us to bless their parents. Help us to bless our students, whatever their ages. Help us, Father, to teach your word faithfully here at Ruthfrid to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you in congregation also. Let us make sure to be faithful to pray for them and support them and encourage them uh, throughout the year. God bless you. You may be seated. This time, let us please kneel or bow for our closing prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your great love for your church. And we thank you that you have united us in you as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would help us to continue to live that love out toward one another, to care for one another. Lord God, we pray, especially today, for those who need your healing hand upon them. We pray for Susan Barrett, for Sharon Alsop, for Timmy Langkamp. Lord God, we pray that you administer strength and healing to them. We pray for Joan Morton as she prepares for surgery this week, O oh God, that you would strengthen and sustain her. We pray for Linda Baxendale, that you would give her your comfort and peace. She mourns Bob's passing. And Lord, throughout the, the funeral and just this coming week, that you give her extra strength. We pray for Bob Thomas, that you would draw near to him with your peace and your presence. That same prayer, Lord, we would pray for Gladys Stewart as well, as she is, is failing, Lord, at this time. Lord, we continue to, to pray and, and to celebrate gift of life and, and love as we think of the anniversary of Mick and Marlene, 45 years, Bob and Judy, 50 years. God, we pray your continued blessings upon them. And for the upcoming conference, Lutherans for Life, Lord God, we pray that you would cause all the pieces to come together for that conference, and that would be a wonderful time of celebrating your gift of life. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.